And we are joined now by Neil Vallely, researcher in economic, uh, at Economic and Social Research Aotearoa, and also lecturer of sociology at University of Ota Otago uh, in New Zealand. Sorry if I butchered uh, any of those pronunciations, okay. Neil, uh, and also author of the book that we're discussing today, Futilitarianism, Neoliberalism, and the Production of Uselessness. Neil, thanks so much for coming on. Hi, Emma. Thanks so much for having me. Um, of course. And we should say joining us from New Zealand, where it is Friday, uh, which is blowing our minds here at the studio. But uh, <laughs> uh, coming from the future, Neil, to talk about his book. Um, uh, your, your book is really touches on so many things that like we try to discuss here at the Majority Report. You, you put it you know, more eloquently than I could. Uh, but what I what I love is how you how your book was born really um it's out of your personal experience with budget slashing to humanities divisions uh, at, at your university like social studies etc we've talked about this on the show before how they're deemed indulgent or unimportant and you know go into stem uh, something that'll make you money essentially because they don't sufficiently serve capitalism and in fact they they challenge many capitalist notions so um, what did you observe in your own personal experience with your profession that led you to exploring this a bit more? Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, that's very kind. Um, yeah, yeah. So basically, that that's where the book started for me. Was I finished my PhD in 2015 here in New Zealand, and about six months after I finished my PhD, the humanities division at my university went through a series of huge cuts where lots of staff were fired. Um, and it really made me start to reflect on basically the idea of of the humanities as as deemed somehow useless by in in a kind of social context or political context. And I started to think about what not simply you know to to buy into that kind of rhetoric of you know we need degrees that are useful in order to get jobs so on and so forth. It was to think about how does something become constructed as useless. Um, and I spend a lot of time now, you know, teaching students about the kind of contemporary university. And, and so say in New Zealand, where I'm based, you know, I, I'm teaching students whose parents would have gone to university where it was free and would have got a bursary to, to go to university. And now I'm teaching a cohort of people who are paying these crazy fees to go to university and are all in debt. And that's a ra completely radical transformation of what education is. And within that context, things like the humanities have been kind of deconstructed um, because they're deemed somehow you can, we, you need, because you're going to get into so much debt, you need to go to university to do something that will get you a job that you can therefore pay that debt back when you're finished. And it's hard to make that argument for things like, an English degree, an English literature degree, or a history degree, or so on and so forth. Um, so I was trying to look into the kind of way that humanities have been completely kind of uh, dismantled by this new kind of economic logic that, that governs the way that universities function. But then the more I started to look into this economic logic, the more I started to look into the idea of uselessness, I started to see that it actually permeates so much of um, the experience of, of contemporary capitalism that it extends way beyond the university into kind of everybody's lives in some way or some shape or form. And that was really the genesis of the book. I started to think about that actually this idea of futility, this idea of uselessness is actually deeply implicated in the way that neoliberal capitalism functions. And so the book or just grew and grew from there and um, developed into what became. Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's so important to flesh out that utility or usefulness are are not things that exist in nature. They're constructed. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to dive into that in a second. But just I, I'm wondering if you could expand on the differences and maybe that you observed in your students one where at a university uh what like in in their response essentially to your teaching at, uh mm -hmm. and 
when they were going to a university that was for profit or paid for or one that was already um i guess paid for by the state yeah um i think there, there's a very justifiable anger with um kind of contemporary students on in in the differences between what university used to be and what it is now um and i think you know i i, I come across lots of students who for instance at my university and I, I think universities across much of the world there's a kind of mental health epidemic among students rise of kind of anxiety and depression um, and they, this is also kind of wider society but for students there's so much pressure on on university and they're getting into so much debt um, so I come across students who are trying to get through their degree within a kind of shorter period of time so they don't get into so much debt but then that puts so much pressure on them that they're studying so many courses each semester that they're kind of highly stressed. Um, and they also look at the future in a completely different way um, to their kind of parents' generation in that they, they look, they, they see themselves getting into debt, they see themselves getting this degree, and then they come out and there's a kind of job market where, you know, precarious work, it's really unclear of, what the kind of future holds they can't afford to buy any property any house housing they look at the kind of um climate the kind of dumpster fire that we're kind of that their generation and our generation have to um confront and there's a kind of sense of deep sense of futility of why am i getting this degree why am i getting into so much debt when there's this kind of future that doesn't guarantee that i will have any kind of prospects and that's where i was trying to get to with the idea of utilitarianism it's a sense that students and it's obviously the book is not just about students but but students are a good example in that they are trying to on some level maximize their utility as economists might call it which is trying to make themselves as as useful as as possible but in doing so the kind of collective economic and social conditions in which they kind of enter into the world are being dismantled on a daily basis and it's this yeah. kind of gap between their experience their drive and experience to try and maximize utility and the kind of world that they enter there's a lot of you know online right-wing influencers who are i think exploiting a sense of atomization from certain segments mm -hmm. of the population um and the reality is, is that people look can look no further than what you discuss in your book, where how does one how does one uh, feel at peace in the society when your identity or like your success uh, in that society is fundamentally tied to your utility and mm -hmm. oftentimes uh maximizing your utility as you talk about in in your book as well is just like fundamentally Im impossible so it's it's the uh, uh it, it, it it's that in and of itself is quite alienating yeah yeah very much so um and that that's the kind of uh, and that so that that's where i try to get with the idea of utilitarianism and extending it beyond say the experience of students is that I, the more the more and more you kind of examine kind of contemporary society, you realize that so many of us are engaged in activities that that economists would describe as maximizing our utility. Um, so we're kind of at a point where so many people are kind of working longer than ever beyond the hours that are actually paid for. So many people are trying to learn new skills, get an education, so on and so forth, getting into debt and doing so. And as they keep doing this, it, it seems like our kind of the, the the collective, the common good is kind of dismantled at the same time by kind of neoliberal capitalism. And part of the trajectory that I try to to map in the book is from this idea of what we call utilitarianism, which many people I'm sure have heard of. And I don't want to necessarily delve into the kind of um, boring political economy history of utilitarianism but the the base i was planning on... on it i was planning on it. oh great <laughs> yeah great we can um fill our boots with um jeremy bentham and, and yes exactly um, 
Yeah, but, but the base, basic premise of utilitarianism is that if each individual maximizes their utility, then it'll lead to the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people. It's a kind of majoritarian ethics. Um, and there's deep problems with that idea, which I can uh, identify in the book. But what I argue is that with neoliberalism, we have flipped into a form of utilitarianism, where actually, where individuals, as individuals maximize their own individual utility, it actually leads to the active deconstructing of the common good, of the greatest happiness. So it leads ultimately to the greatest unhappiness of the greatest number of people. And yet we are completely trapped in this scenario that we have no other choice than to try and maximize your utility but in doing so it actively works against our kind of common good and a few individuals will rise to the top a few individuals will maximize your utility and benefit from it but the vast majority of people won't and they'll get trapped in debt in in the inability to 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 live kind of valuable and and um enjoyable lives yeah, and I I remember studying. Well, well, let's talk about Jeremy Bentham, right? Who uh, you kind of trace as the founder, uh, the, the intellectual, you know, genesis behind utilitarianism. And I remember reading him in college, and the the fixation on uh, pain and pleasure as this binary, um, where that rules all human beings. You flesh this out as well, but it 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 creates a very um, perverse set of incentives if you're going to structure your society around that binary. Um, can you uh, talk a bit about what what his theory about the world is and how it birthed utilitarianism, which, as you trace, eventually does branch, and one of the branches is neoliberalism? Yeah, so, um, yeah, Bentham uh, kind of, strange kind of figure strange kind of thinker um marx was extremely critical of him he called him a a a, a, a deeply english phenomenon and a, a kind of uh, <laughs> a kind of very limited thinker um but his, his basic premise was so he identified utility as as you say as the the kind of should be the kind of goal of each individual and he really he he saw utility basically as pursuing in every decision you make pursuing the thing that gives you pleasure over pain and the most um ethical decision was the one that produced the most pleasure um against pain over a kind of long period um and it's interesting for that for him he could never quite define how we go about measuring utility and uh, partly because the idea he tried to he 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 thought about utility as if it was some sort of objective phenomenon, mm -hmm. some sort of natural concept that kind of existed in the world, and that actually the things that are constructed as useful or pleasurable and so on and so forth are actually deeply implicated in kind of social structures in which we live, and often governed by the kind of ruling classes who determine what is the most useful course of action for the kind of wider society. They never and I should just acknowledge that. Yeah. And 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 uh, sorry to c interrupt, but like the contradiction no, of pleasure being able to exist in a vacuum, uh, yeah. as opposed to at the expense or uh, at the you know, the creation of pain of others, which is just like that's exploitation and that's foundational yeah. to the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And and, and I think. The, the kind of ideas of pleasure that that people like Bentham and, and future utilitarian thinkers put forward very much kind of Western um, ideas um, of of pleasure, um, and it's interesting that for him, for Bentham, he tries to come up with kind of examples of how we measure utility. At one point, he he thinks about measuring pulse rate, and then he kind of abandons the idea, and eventually he settles on money as the as the measurement of utility and he says something like the the barometer is the measurement of air pressure the thermometer is the measurement of um temperature money is the measurement of utility so it's obvious here how this overlaps with kind of capitalist capitalist accumulation capital accumulation and uh, basically he's saying that all the, the the thing that we must pursue on an individual level is utility and if utility is money then the thing we must pursue is is money that we must 
accumulate as much money as possible on an individual level. And this, of course, kind of uh, is attractive to kind of um, classical economists and, and neoclassical economists in the 19th century, and then into the 20th century, the kind of neoliberal thinkers um, take on a kind of form of utilitarianism um, that eventually develops into the kind of capitalism that we um, experience today. But this link between utility and money is deeply um is at the heart of, of utilitarian thinking and utilitarian thinking has a major impact on the development of economic science over the kind of 19th and, and 20th century and and i mean i think it's it's might be easier for people to draw the conclusion to neoliberalism and uh what milton friedman kind of thinking but you also contend that it becomes so ubiquitous that it is in a way also uh embedded in the keynesian model of economic thought yeah. um and it's kind of fruit from the same rotten tree uh how how so yeah so i i i and i kind of chart um the, the the influence of utilitarian thinking of economic science uh really diverts um with the the wall street crash and the great depression and you see the development of what i call the book two kind of strands of kind of anti-utilitarian thinking but two strands that still incorporate the utilitarian ideas into their thought so one is Keynes's model um, which which takes the kind of majoritarian aspect of of um, utilitarian thinking and places it at the center so basically how do we try and ensure on some level the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people um, and so that's to build a kind of strong um interventionist model in the economy that that um that becomes the base of you know social de democratic states big welfare states post second world war social democracy so on and so forth and then on the other hand there's the kind of uh hayekian friedrich hayek inspired anti-utilitarianism which takes the individual aspect of utilitarianism uh, over the individual over the majority and situates that that at the heart of a kind of philosophy of of society and these two anti-utilitarian stances are kind of in competition um th through the kind of mid 20th century the keynesian model is kind of winning until the 1970s and the kind of economic and social crises of the 1970s where then the 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 neoliberal form of utilitarianism emerges kind of victorious and becomes the kind of basis of a new kind of hegemonic block uh, uh, politically through people like Reagan and Thatcher and econ economically through the kind of ideas of, of institutions like the IMF and the World Bank and so on and so forth. And this becomes the kind of governing logic of the world that we now, now inhabit. Yeah, and um, it, it um, in its, uh, I guess, found foundational piece uh for neoliberalism there how neoliberalism wins out over the keynesian model it's it's somewhat of like asymmetrical warfare i mean we'll talk about it uh in like the context of why can the republicans discipline their or, or have more ideological consistency among their fringe members where it's it's a bit of a a hodgepodge and difficult yeah. for the left to use its leverage within the context of the democratic party it's because well on that side they're all in agreement like industry yeah. capital business that that's 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 what we're going to side with and so um it it, it make uh, the neoliberalism winning out over keynesian majoritarian economics is kind of the, the same yeah. argument which is that well, you might want to lead with something stronger as opposed to playing on their turf. Yeah, yeah, that's a really interesting point, and I think that that and and I can identify that in the book, and uh, many other scholars have is that the kind of left that we encounter now, and I think that's a really perceptive point, is that the right in, are are extremely kind of elite. On some level, they are unified. You're right, all, all around the kind of certain way that society should be function and it's one that we deeply sh should challenge and and, and uh, it's deeply problematic uh, 
but part of the problem for the left is that from really from the 1990s onwards, particularly in the US and, and in places like the UK and parts of Europe, um, is that the left the embrace neoliberalism. Um, neoliberalism is the kind of heart of, of Bill Clinton's project. Um, same with Tony Blair in the UK, where I'm based in New Zealand, actually, in the 1980s, it's a left-wing government that implements what's, what is called here is the Roger Rogernomics, named after the finance minister. <laughs> But it was a neoliberal revolution of, of the economy and society led by a left-wing government. And what this really did is kind of splinter the left. And, and Nancy Fraser, um, the kind of Marxist uh, 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 philosopher, uh, she calls what emerges in the 1990s as a kind of progressive neoliberalism. So it's a neoliberalism that, that embraces kind of social liberalism, um, kind of certain... It, 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 uh, uh, embraces kind of uh, uh, social social forms of, of liberation um, from kind of certain forms of rights and so on and so forth. But at the heart of it, it embraces it deeply embraces a kind of economic model of neoliberalism, and this creates a real problem for the left going forward. A problem that we now encounter in the kind of splintering of left wing parties. It's a kind of left wing that's still committed to a neoliberal economic model. And a left that is now developing around kind of democratic socialism or other forms of kind of social democracy, and these kind of it creates a kind of left that is 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 kind of often confused and um, in, introverted and and kind of fighting against itself against its kind of instincts. There's this kind of it's particularly kind of old, now kind of kind of older generation of the left that 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 have kind of implemented neoliberalism kind of are rubbing up against against a new kind of younger left that are that have seen the kind of impact of neoliberalism particularly post 2008 post the global financial crisis and they can see that the that, that this model that was supposedly supposed to give us the best of both worlds supposed to give us kind of economic growth and everything that that brings with us and kind of social liberation we start to see that it's given us neither and the left are deeply conflicted on that in a way that the right aren't. And w oftentimes we'll talk about that as institutionalism, right? There is still mm. segments of people on left of center parties that I, I think like borderline fetishize our institutions at the expense of like, making people's lives better. Uh, how does that fit into your um your your thesis here yeah that's a really interesting point and um i i, I think point one of the best um analysis of this comes from um quinn Slobodian and his work um uh his book globalists which is on the kind of uh uh the rise of neoliberal kind of decline of empire and the rise of neoliberalism he comes up with this idea of market encasement thesis and his basically the premise of that in a kind of simple way is that neoliberalism is about the protection of the market from democracy so it's about creating a system of institutions that can encase the market so that that basically democracy comes up becomes about making decisions that do not in any way um, challenge the kind of the way that the market functions um, today. Um, so, for instance, where I based in New Zealand, so much of politics, so much of kind of political decisions that we can make are about things that have so little to do with the economy. For instance, we had a big referendum on whether New Zealand should change its flag, which is kind of here or there, but we can't have a referendum of whether New Zealand should um, uh, embrace kind of IMF models of, of neoliberal economics. But these things are completely outside the realm of democratic politics now. And that's basically the main idea of neoliberalism is to protect the market using institutions to, to protect it from democratic decision-making. And the left that now that are really kind of the the, the the parts of the left that kind of embrace these institutions, as you said, have kind of formed institutionalism, are in this sense trying to uh, 
protect the market from democracy. And that's a real problem for the left. Um, we thought, we, we've seen recently, of course, the last few years, the kind of anti-democratic aspects of the right, which are kind of often violent and kind of nihilistic and, and play out on our kind of TV screens and these kind of, uh, we even this in the last week or so, we've seen Brazil with the kind of storming of their Congress and so on and so forth. We can see kind of anti-democracy in those acts, but the left kind of anti-democracy is a lot more kind of insipid and a lot more uh, subtle but it's based in it's exactly based in that kind of institutionalism that you identify and i think that's a real problem for the left as you said we put more faith in these institutions than we do in the idea of trying to make people's lives better and i think that is a kind of conflict that we're going to have to to overcome on the left we're going to have to flip that around and actually see these institutions as part of the problem you, you mentioned nihilism there, and uh, at one point in your book, you talk, you make the distinction and make a note of how futility uh, is not nihilism, which, you know, it, it, that your book is futilitarianism. So um, what, wh why did you find it important to make that distinction? Because I think there has been a, a great amount of nihilism over the past few decades uh, as a result of, you know, all of the things we describe about the, the isolation and atomization uh, of neoliberalism. Yeah, and I thought I felt like it was a really important distinction to make uh, because ultimately, as, as I say in the book, I, I see this idea of futil futilitarianism as a kind of hopeful endeavor and I get towards that, towards the kind of conclusion of the book. But nihilism for me is a kind of a sort of end in itself in that uh, there, there are, I identify two kind of forms of nihilism using the philosopher Simon Critchley's idea of active and passive nihilism. Active nihilism is a kind of destructive form of nihilism, which we've seen in you know the January 6th kind of uprising we've seen in Brazil in the last week. So we see it in forms of terrorism and so on and so forth. It's a sense of the world is meaningless. I am basically going to destroy it because it is meaningless. Um, and the more kind of passive nihilism is a kind of acceptance that, that the world is kind of meaningless and you just kind of embrace that. that kind of, and we see that kind of mind, mindlessness, kind of consumption, um, so on and so forth. There's these kind of two forms of nihilism and, it, and there's lots in between there as well, but those are the two kind of extremes forms of nihilism, a kind of acceptance of meaningless, meaninglessness. But with the idea of Futility, what I'm trying to do is trying to, to identify a kind of experience that so many of us have as, as a way to try and overcome that sense of futility. So it's a means to an end. And for me, futility is different to nihilism because it's often, it's more kind of unconscious. Nihilism actually requires you to kind of to acknowledge a kind of meaninglessness, whereas futility is a, a lot more per pervasive in society, but most of us are kind of not really conscious of it. And what I try to do with that, the term futility is to try to identify a kind of common experience that many of us, that many of us have. And that, that's one be one of the real, um, uh, what I've been extremely happy with the kind of reaction to the book is that lots of people have said that, idea kind of i i can identify with that idea of utility that name is something that i experience in my everyday life and i don't want to have that experience and so what that's where i see a difference between futility and nihilism futility can be the starting point of starting to build something that is better whereas nihilism is basically just an acceptance that things are meaninglessness are meaningless mm -hmm. and we're just going to just either accept that or destroy it in chapter five, you explore something really interesting um, about how forms of political action in um, uh, many countries on, on in the world right now often uh, involve people attempting to exercise their individual economic power, whether it be boycotting <coughs> things. And, you know, I support BDS, for example, but... Uh, it's like just, that is just that there. I recognize the limitations of that. Um, but uh, 
and and how you know one's uh, purchasing power is conflated or often melded with one's voting power. Um, yeah. it, it that that's troubling in and of itself. But um, how does that fit into the uh, to the 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 politics of futility? Hmm. Yeah, so that's that's kind of yeah, as you said, kind of chapter five of the book is trying to identify the political impact of of uh, futilitarianism is that it, it it traps us into not through really through any of our own doing, but the traps us into a kind of mindset that that political change, political action, is the result of individual decision making, and. And therefore, that's where we get into a kind of consumer politics, for, for instance, where we we think, for instance, that buying certain products, so on and so forth. If we all do that, then this will make kind of huge kind of change in the world. And the point you make there about um, the conflation between kind of purchasing power and political power, I think has become fundamental, particularly, sadly, in the kind of progressive politics. And... So, for instance, I, I look at the idea of uh, voting, voting with your dollar, which several kind of progressive kind of campaigns have kind of either implicitly or explicitly expressed the idea that you can enact um, kind of political change by the decisions that you make with your purchases. Um, and what this actually accepts without realizing it is kind of neoliberal forms of depoliticization. It's the idea that you can somehow sidestep the kind of messiness of politics, the kind of the 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 organizing that's required, the kind of democratic decision makings, the the kind of uh the 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 struggles that are that politics requires. You can sidestep all of this simply by just your using your credit card. And this actually, this is a kind of almost a neoliberal dream. Many of the neoliberal thinkers actually discuss this idea of voting with your dollar, that the idea that purchasing power becomes the basis of politics. And actually, it's often on on, on kind of what we might think of, of, of left politics that has implicitly embraced this depoliticization. And then we start to think that simply that our that our individual political, what we think are political decisions, are somehow going to kind of enact widespread change, and then we um, we we come into a world we realize that the world hasn't really changed through these individual actions. One very funny uh, kind of uh, experience I had was in a, 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 a green grocers. I don't know what you call them in the US. Kind of a store that sells fruit and veg, um, and I, a, a woman came in behind me and said, "Look, these apples still have stickers on them. I signed a petition last week to say that we should uh, that apples should not have stickers on them, and yet they still have stickers on them." This idea that her individual signing of an online petition could somehow enact this kind of structural change to the way that we eat apples was kind of absurd and yet it was the kind of basis of her kind of political imagination was simply that through her individual action it can somehow enact this huge kind of structural change um lastly we had someone write in with a question for you um dan the birdman says could you ask him how neoliberalism affected the healthcare system in new zealand not sure. That's a little bit of a more concrete question, but if you feel yeah, so I guess that. it's that's yeah. an important question for kind of anyone based in 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 the US. We have a very kind of different healthcare system here. It's much more modelled on something like the UK system, where it's kind of publicly funded um, healthcare. But much like the UK, neoliberalism has has led to the kind of dismantling. Of, of this system and now we the, the healthcare is really creaking in New Zealand um there's massive kind of waiting lists for um for surgeries uh, particularly the kind of uh for uh cancer treatments are being delayed um appointments for people to to have kind of cancer 
cancerous cells are sort of checked um, or been extended out. Um, so by the time people get checked, the cancer is kind of has um, accelerated. Um, and, and COVID obviously had a kind of big impact on that. Is that so many um, of these kind of more routine uh, medical procedures or medical checkups had to be kind of pushed back because COVID was putting such a strain on the system. So neoliberalism has, has had a different effect on kind of healthcare than say in the US, um, but it has had a big effect in the sense that it, that austerity and um, forms of uh, uh, neoliberalization have led to the kind of dismantling of these kind of welfare structures that are um, that you know New Zealand's used to really pride itself. It was a kind of semi-socialist certainly a strong social democratic state in the 1970s. And it's hard to really overestimate the impact that the neoliberal revolution in, in New Zealand has in the 1980s. It completely it kind of upends society. It goes from one of the most protected um, economies, uh, most kind of state, inter uh, economy that's governed by the state to a free market economy almost overnight. And it has this massive massive impact on New Zealand society um, and that healthcare is one of those that really um, goes from being kind of uh, a strong kind of state-funded system to kind of one that now is kind of really creaking at the edges. All right well I appreciate that answer uh, thank you uh, so much uh, Neil Vallely uh, researcher at uh, economic and social research, Aotearoa, if I'm saying that uh, correctly. And Aotearoa. Also, Aotearoa. <laughs> yeah. And also a uh, lecturer of sociology at University of uh, Otago in, in New Zealand. Thank you so much, uh, Neil, for your time today. The book is Futilitarianism, Neoliberalism, and the Production of Uselessness. Cool. Thank you, Emma. Yep, of course. And links will be in the description, all that, uh, if you if you want to check out Neil's book. I really appreciate your time today. Thanks so much.